This is Global Tennessee, news analysis and commentary from the Tennessee World Affairs Council in Nashville. Global Tennessee is produced in association with the Center for International Business at Belmont University and the International Business Council of the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. The World Affairs Council is a nonpartisan, nonprofit educational association, and the views expressed on Global Tennessee are those of the participants. Welcome to the June 9th episode of Global Nashville with Carl Dean. I'm Patrick Ryan, President of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Thanks for joining us. Today, Carl will be talking with Mr. Amr El Husseini, founder and CEO of Lodestone Advisory Group in Nashville. Our topic this evening is designing an economic model for Nashville as a city of the future. You can start adding your questions to the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as possible after Carl and Amr's conversation. Let me also mention that we have a special edition of our speakers program tomorrow. Mark Braden from the World Affairs Council Board will be moderating a discussion with Rachel Dean Wilson and David Salvo of the Alliance for Securing Democracy. They'll be talking about foreign interference undermining the 2020 election. Don't miss that important conversation. It starts at 1 p.m. Central Time. Lastly, let me remind you that the World Affairs Council is a membership organization. We rely on you to be members and to contribute to our work of bringing global affairs awareness programs like this terrific program to the community. So please visit tnwac.org to join or make a gift. We'll also have a phone number in the chat box during the program where you can make a text to give donation. Thank you for making the council's programs possible. Amr al Husseini was always fascinated and interested by the world of business, investments, and banking. As a child growing up in Beirut, Lebanon, he saved part of his weekly pocket money in a bank account until he was able to open a tiny stock trading account at a very young age. Nowadays, he is a seasoned global investor and strategist. Amr has worked across five continents over the course of his career in corporate development, venture capital, turnaround and transformation, corporate strategy, innovation and entrepreneurship, international expansion, and investment banking. Prior to founding Lodestone, Amr served in several capacities, the last of which was the head of international development at the QIB Group. There, he was responsible for the bank's international operations and strategic investments, as well as the bank's international network stretching from the United Kingdom to Malaysia. Prior to his work at QIB, Amr worked in several banking and consulting roles with regional and international firms, including Path Solutions, Franza Bank, Ernst & Young, HSBC, and Audi Bank. Amr is a mentor at the Wondery, Vanderbilt University's Innovation Center, a board member at the Entrepreneur Advisory Council within Vanderbilt's Center for Technology Transfer and Commercialization, and an advisory board member to the Tennessee World Affairs Council. That's us. He has also served on the selection and investment committees for a number of local and international accelerators. Recently, Amr served board of director terms for an international banking subsidiary of the QIB Group and the International Business Council of the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. Amr is a graduate of Harvard, Harvard Business School's general management program. He also received an MBA from the University of Wales and a BS in finance and accounting from Rafiq Hariri University, where he presented, where he was presented with the Alumni Achievement Award. Amr also holds certified uh, Islamic professional accounting certification. He is fluent in English, French, and Arabic. His short list for success, perseverance, consistency, integrity, global awareness, intellectual curiosity, and ambition. Well, we're all about global awareness here. Carl? Amr, great having you with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege. And I guess the, you know, there are a lot of things going on in the world, but there is a lot of good news and some good news uh, happened here in Nashville, Tennessee, where you are a new father. Yes, we're very happy. We have um, a new baby and uh, that process has been the highlight of the past few months. We've been uh, blessed with a baby girl and uh, she's now five and a half, six weeks old. And we're having a lot of fun with that process. Um, partially thanks to like the lockdown and being able to spend more time at home. So um, 
Yeah, there's a silver lining to everything. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife, who I know well, uh, Summer is one of the one of my favorite people and is one of the most, uh, I think, committed people to economic development in Tennessee and in Nashville and is a, is a great lawyer. So give her my best. And again, congratulations to you. This is, um, you will look back on 2020 as a great year and that's the way it should be. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, and Pat, thank you so much for the lengthy um, introduction. I don't think <laughs> we need it. <laughs> well, yeah. it, it, was, it was fascinating. Um, could you just tell us, um, you know, we, we got your educational background and, and certainly the sense that you have a, an extensive business background with um, international involvement. But tell us about, you know, where you're from, how you got to Nashville, um, you know, what brought you here? Yeah, so I was born in uh, Beirut, Lebanon, and um, I, I grew up there until college. After college, I started mostly traveling for professional, so for jobs, for work I was doing. I jumped um, a few times between the consulting, management consulting, and investment banking world, and I did banking as well. So I was uh, moving between these for a few years. Um, until um, the last like seven, seven, eight years, I was focused on international development and investment banking. So I was mostly um, responsible for um, restructuring, expanding global operations of financial institutions, um, investing in private equity. So that gave me, I was fortunate to be able to travel to a lot of places around the world, do work with uh, government agencies, uh, businesses, um, um, and uh, for profits, non profits across the board. And um, in 2013, we started actually in 2011, we started talking about finding a place where we want to move and permanently relocate. And uh, we had, I would say, at least 15 cities um, on our list, and we ended up choosing Nashville for multiple reasons. I think the top two are uh, the potential that we saw in Nashville. Um, and that has been something that we had experienced both Samar and myself in multiple cities where we just happened to be at the right time during very high growth years and we saw the opportunity that comes with and the change that comes with uh, high growth. We saw Nashville as a, an opportunity or a place where we can impact a lot of positive change and want to be able to do that wherever we are. Uh, the second is being close to family. Summer went to Vanderbilt and has family close. So we ended up choosing Nashville and moving in 2014. Uh, we've been here ever since. Uh, we founded Lodestone Advisory Group in 2013. Um, we focus on three main areas, um, internationalization. So how to make sense of the world for investors, for companies, um, for um, government agencies across the board, basically. We uh, work on innovation, innovation, how to create ecosystem change to, to, to enable and um, encourage more innovation, uh, corporate innovation for existing large companies, and all the way down to the startup community and creating a stronger startup community. The third piece is venture capital. So to complete those two, the third piece, that came naturally to our work and to our background and experience was venture capital. So how to pick winners, um, early stage companies that are C to series A stage and uh, help them through the growth stages, how to help them not only grow in their local market and make the right decisions, but also how to make sense of the world and see the world as their potential global, uh, like ultimately global market instead of uh, focusing locally. How have you found national Number one, as a as a place to live and to start a family, um, and then number two, as a place to do international business. So um, the first part, how did how have we found Nashville? We I started visiting Nashville for several several years before we decided to move. Um, we found we both love Nashville. I found Nashville as um, as someone who has grown up outside of the city, unlike Summer, who has been around for a longer, much longer time. I found Nashville to be, uh, first of all, very welcoming. It's a great city with, uh, with the most important 
thing in, in, a, in a city that you want to live in are the people and uh, people are fantastic. Uh, the culture in Nashville is actually very close to uh, where I grew up in Beirut, where you have a lot of family connections. You have uh, three generations that are closely connected. Uh, this is something that we value a lot, obviously. Uh, but also, the it's a small market where a lot of people, like everyone knows everyone. So within a very quick um, time frame, you're able to meet a lot of people and be part of uh, valuable conversations. This is something that we value a lot and we love about Nashville. This is our impression of it. And that's one of the main reasons also um, to attract us to Nashville. On the business sense, um, we came, as I said earlier, we came for the potential of Nashville. Um, I think thinking back five years later, I see that um, I'm still a little um, like looking for more from Nashville to capitalize on its potential. Uh, one, as an international city, I think we lack the international connectivity um, on, on a number of levels. There are international events, there are uh, visitors, all of that is great, but I think the deep rooted infrastructure that connects us to, to global cities of the world, I think we can do uh, better on that. On the second piece, um, the development, the economic development. Our model of economic development, which I know this is, this is at the core of our topic um, for today, um, the, uh, the core of the economic development that is going on today, I think needs to be um, reviewed and revisited uh, to make it more a few, few, like one of the future, one where we can look forward and think where is the, the growth coming in the next 20 years and how do we develop an economy that's not only resilient but that's also putting us on the global map with regards to um, how we create economic value and growth yeah. in the future. Before we get to economic development, is you know this has been um, an eventful year in that I think many of our discussions on this program have uh, involved the crisis around COVID-19, um, and then in recent uh, days we've had sort of the public reaction in the in the in the gray sense that there needs to be reform in the area of policing in the United States and with mass protests. And you're in a unique position because um, first, let's talk about COVID-19. I mean, you obviously um, travel internationally. Um, I assume you still have family connections to Lebanon and, and, and Beirut. Um, how is COVID-19 affecting what you do? Yeah, so the first change is I don't travel internationally. I used to travel internationally until three months ago and the whole world changed unfortunately but i think um i think i look at covid19 as two things it's um, first of all there's the healthcare or medical piece of it that is something uh, that's a process that is being addressed through science and research and medicine and ultimately this will go away i think the everlasting impact that covid19 is going to have is on uh, people's behavior on decision making on models of economic development, on how businesses function, um, on economies in the long term, global economies, because whether we um, we like acknowledge it every day or sometimes we overlook that, we are the largest economy in the world here, but we're also part of a global uh, marketplace. And a lot of our top, fun like most um, productive, businesses are ones that are international and that have to deal with the world. So when we have massive regions of the world going through um, economic challenges, even if our economy is recovering at, at a faster pace, this is something that the whole world will see um, an impact from and um, will have an impact directly or indirectly on us. So we need to take it into consideration and probably do more thinking around how we can create alternatives that are uh, that compensate for the gaps that would come uh, in the future. So again, just as a summary, the, the, the medical piece, I think, is something that's the easier one to, to look into and to talk about from an economic point of view. I think the, larger, the, the longer term impact is going to be from an economy. 
point out. What do you hear from uh, Lebanon and from your family in Beirut about um, what's happening there with COVID-19 or other parts? So, of so it, it came at a very challenging time with regards to the economy. The economy has been going through a very rough cycle, like many economies, both in Europe and in, uh, in parts of the Levant and the Middle East. Lebanon specifically has been pushing very hard. Like there's a big uh, like popular movement pushing for um, for restructuring uh, government operations and for uh, um, passing new laws. And that came at a very critical time, I think, that impacted. I was shocked or surprised, I'm still surprised, on how well they dealt with it and how well they contained it and how well the numbers are in comparison to countries or cities of the same size. We're talking about hundreds of cases um, and very, very few deaths so far. The cost obviously is very high, the economic cost is high, but, uh, but the, the measures that were taken were taken early enough and uh, efficiently that they prevented catas catastrophe. Um, with, with the impact that that could have had on the economy, if, like, if they didn't contain it, I think it would have been much worse than, than the situation today. But they are at a place where they're starting to reopen gradually, but they are keeping very firm, um, uh, a very firm grip on uh, monitoring new cases and dealing with uh, any outbreaks that might happen. In terms of uh, the events that have happened around the death of George Floyd, that tragedy and the sort of the public outcry and demand for reform uh, in terms of policing, um, from your perspective, and you come at, I think you can come at this in sort of a unique way, I mean, you, you clearly have, have seen political unrest um, in Lebanon, and how, how is that going to impact the United States in terms of international relations, business? What, what, what is the international reaction to this? This is, this is a, a great question. I think uh, I'm going to try to like, take a little bit of time to reflect as I'm uh, trying to elaborate on, on some of these. I think the, the three pieces to it that we need to acknowledge that came out um, very powerfully over the past few weeks is there's an issue with justice, equity, and um, economic opportunity. And those three come very much hand in hand. They are very connected. And equity comes by offering opportunity, but also giving, like, you need to be at the same level playing field to be able to compete. I think one thing, we can connect so many parts of what's happening today with other aspects of uh, lack of equity that are all connected at the bottom to the economy. Um, I'm going to take a second to talk about that. I think the, the message that resonated with countless countries, I have friends in at least 50, uh, 60 countries that I speak with regularly. And uh, the, 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 I, I'm, I'm very inspired by, by how loud the message has resonated and how it connected to global injustices that are not directly connected to that same issue of race or of, um, of equity. Different countries or different parts of the world have different challenges, but the message of, of justice that came out of that and the reaction of the people um, to finally feel we're fed up with this and we're doing something to change it, I think resonated very loudly with countries across the globe. Um, the second piece to it is something that, that we have seen um, I think in the country for, um, for, for some time now. And it's a little bit unfortunate because I have seen it elsewhere in the world and I know what it means 20 years from now. Uh, we're just at the beginning of uh, tampering with or trying to change how the justice system functions and trying to make changes that are strategic, like not strategic, but tactical for, um, for, uh, for smaller purposes than maintaining uh, the balance of the country and that in the long term usually when you have judges that are uh, that that have accountability by somebody that made the appointment or when you start dealing with uh, policing or justice from that angle the long-term damage is very high and that's how you see countries on the scale of like you you call it corruption you call it uh, indicators a lot of these usually um, it's not favorable 
And um, I happen to have seen it in places like Beirut, where um, on the like, following a, a period of 15 years of unrest, um, you had what, what is called the warlords or the people that have taken an active role in a war. This is the same thing, except that you don't have um, military engagement, you don't have a war. The same thing is when you have uh, so much disruption and so much divide um, in the country and you're moving people to opposite directions and you're trying to still maintain um, one structure for the government. It's a very natural uh, intervention that uh, one part or the other tries to intervene uh, to that, to, like to, to have a tougher grip on, uh, on parts of the government and this is something I feel to be dangerous. Well, um, let's turn to economic development. You've, um, obviously this is an area that you've worked in and you've given some thoughts to um, what needs to happen or what you'd like to see happen here in Nashville and in Tennessee. Uh, tell me, how do you think we should be moving forward? Um, so let me take a quick uh, minute just to put it into perspective. Um, the world, in the past 100 years has evolved from the industrial revolution in the um, early in the century, early in the 1900s, all the way to, to, to the middle 1900s um, or later 60s, 70s. Uh, that was replaced with an economic model that says you as a city or you as a state, you compete by being attractive to businesses. You go out and actively recruit jobs. And to do that, you have your own budget, you have your economic incentives, you pay incentives to attract businesses, and those typically bring jobs with them, and that's how you grow the economy. And that model is no longer valid, and this is where I think we need to transition and look at the future. The, the model that has replaced that probably in the mid 2000s, so in the last 10, 15 years, I would say, we started seeing cities, uh, the fastest growing cities or economies are cities that have acknowledged that you can no longer justify um, incentivizing or to take it extreme buying jobs, but you need to create your own. And you need to create your own within what is called the knowledge economy. Knowledge economy focusing on science, scientific research, technology, engineering, math, etc. The ones that bring with them a, a multiplier effect. When you, when you create a, a knowledge economy job, which I'm calling a job of the future, typically to support that one job, there are several aspects or several layers that come with it from the support, like the first layer is your restaurants and salons and yoga studios. The second layer is your doctors and lawyers and accountants. And the third layer is your investment community and your, like that whole ecosystem comes with those types of jobs when you're creating your own. And that multiplier, uh, surprisingly, there are studies, very credible studies, that say that when you're bringing a back office type job, incentivizing a job to move into town versus creating your own, there is almost a three, three and a half fold difference. So one job creates a multiplier of about 1.3, 1.4, whereas the other creates around 4.4, 4.5 times um, its impact. This is the first piece. The second piece is how are we, like tax money is, um, is being spent anyway, but we have to spend it, the more, I think, the wisest possible as a state and as a city to create the best economic impact that's sustainable. There are massive industries. We happen to be uh, blessed in Nashville to have a huge industry like the healthcare industry. But if you, if you take a look and analyze the direction of where things are going in healthcare, and how are our companies in town are performing, we see that there's a big innovation gap and that healthcare in 10 years is, going, is no longer going to be done in hospitals the same way. It's no longer going to be within the same framework that exists today. That brings something which is called disruptive innovation or innovation or changes. Um, and we've seen so many industries change and be completely disrupted. Some of the largest companies have disappeared in other industries because they are so big or because they have not innovated so big to, to shift or pivot or because they were not unable to, to see that wave coming. I think 
um, the, the, the baseline or the back backbone of our economy being in healthcare is a great asset that we need to use to create the future and to co consolidate on instead of relying on it to keep producing jobs for the next 30 years. So I would, I would say um, to, like those are the two aspects. One is how we're looking at developing our own growth for the economy. And the second piece is how we're capitalizing on our strength and sectors that, um, that are there already. All right. What do you see, at, are there any impediments you see to Nashville's growth as a center for international business? Um, yes, I think, um, I think a couple of things. One is um, true diversity that brings that connectivity, the true diversity at the level of um, organizations, boards, um, leadership. I think that we can definitely do a lot more. And when I look at, um, like, I'll give you a few indicators. As a state, we are, uh, when it comes to innovation, for example, and creating innovation capacity, we are in the top and in, in the bottom five, unfortunately. Now, when I look at this, I see that we're doing great as a, uh, we're doing, like, with all that we're doing in Nashville, we're at the bottom. This is an opportunity for growth. This is an opportunity to create more capacity. I think there are a little bit of disconnects between multiple pieces of our ecosystem being research capability, our universities and research capabilities, our talent production, um, um, the investment, like having the invest, like the open invested base that is investing in the brightest and most talented and the most attractive investment opportunities. There's a little bit of, like when we talk about that specifically, um, one thing to point out, um, you're, like you're asking me about examples and I want to be as clear as possible. When we look at the venture capital activity in the city, we see that we've gone um, backwards by about 40% between 2016 to 18, for example. And when we talk, when we try to address the core of that, I find that some of the conversations I'm having are telling me, well, this is privately funded. This is self-funded. Self-funding is not innovation. Self-funding is not, it's good. It's great we have it. It's great we have people that have the capacity to do that. But innovation comes when you throw out your idea to the market because you need more than the money. You need the talent, you need the expertise, you need the support system. So you need to throw it out to the investment community that is a professional investment community, not only to help you grow it, but to, to be able to, to create the checks and balances. This is something that we have, I think, a little bit of challenge doing at the moment, but I, I see no reason why this cannot change. And this is, I would like just take a second and say, what are the positives from, like we, we, we can talk forever about the challenges from COVID-19 and the crises. I think the more, if we want to look at it the opposite way and see what are the changes and the positive changes that can come, I think a lot of people are listening more. They are listening more because the music is less loud and because there's a lot more reason to do that because of the challenges that are that people are feeling and seeing in the horizon because of the economic um, uh, opportunities that uh, that have been disrupted potentially and the alternatives that everyone is trying to find i think there's a lot more room for conversation exactly the same way um, this is happening with with regards to justice um, there's there's a lot more room for people to talk and get somewhere so yeah, I think this is a great that, opportunity that, for us. One of the things I've always heard about was that, you know, the three T's, the things that make cities work or make them attractive for economic investment um, is number one, talent, which I think is somewhere other Nashville has done well and can do better and will do better, which is being a place where creative young people with uh, technical skills and high education want to be. And then we're also creating those people here. Yeah. Um, I think technology is key. Uh, which we've made progress on, we need to make more progress on. And then I think tolerance. Um, you know, people want to be in a city that um, attracts the best, and that means attracts you know, all types of people, and you got to be an open city. And I think, uh, you know, like every place we have our challenges, but I think that's what we are. Um, what do you think? I mean, certainly we've made progress with the airport. Um, you know, I think one of the things that you've seen the growth in Nashville 
you know, we got the, the flights to, to Britain now, and um, I think as time goes on, and we've had an earlier guest who talked about this, we're going to see more international flights. How important is that to international business? It's very, very important. It's incredibly important, I think, not only for the traffic, uh, but the traffic, the, the think of it as, an, like, as a ripple effect, as an exponential effect of like every 200 people that fly into town are going to talk to another thousand that are going to another 5,000 that are going to recommend the city. And this is not only for visitors. It's not only a direction of visit. It's also, it enables companies to start seeing the place as a hub and as a connector for their global operations. When we talk about being an attractive place for uh, global business, I think um, having the flights and having the airport is at the core of of a strategy like that and yeah. uh, I, I think one of the best decisions the, um, the the Nashville did was to start or restart international flights we have the London flight I know there are conversations about others potentially in the horizon and this is I think a great change uh, the airport being one of the most traveler friendly airports is something I love and I didn't mind before um, taking an, an hour flight to a, to a hub to connect globally, but I think if we have it directly, it's more of an advantage here. Like it, it's even more of an advantage. Great point. And um, Pat, do you have a question, or we're at the end of the half hour? Well, we uh, we do have some questions, and um, we're I think we're we're good on time. So let me uh, start with one from our friend Bob Teague, who is uh, president of the UN Association here in Nashville. Bob asks. With the U.S. and other central banks infusing the world economy with enormous amounts of monetary debt, uh, i.e., moving the decimal points, and with so much money held outside world economies, offshore, out of circulation or reinvestment, how will accounts ever be reconciled and debt holders be compensated? Well, well, this is this is a great question, and it's probably like we can go for hours about this on like only this question. It's a uh, it's a huge uh, debate at the moment. It's a big dilemma. I think it's more, um, like to put it into a very simple words, it's the last resort option that central banks and governments have at the moment. They have um, post 2008 crisis, they have dipped and tapped into a lot of the tools that they have at hand from interest rates, taxes, et cetera, to, to, to be able to restart economies and to, uh, to, to incentivize growth in economies. I think we're seeing some economies that never re recovered from that, um, especially with the growth rates in the Eurozone. This is one of the areas that's the second largest block, a consumer block in the world at the moment and, uh, and still are going through very big discrepancies in that sense. So you're left with only one option, print money. Is it a good option and increase the debt? Is it a great option? Definitely not. Is it sustainable in the long term? Definitely not. I think the hope is, like the, the rationale is, hopefully something will change uh, to where growth will kick, in, kick back in and we're able to justify having that debt and start through a, a longer term plan um, to reduce it. Um, though I think this is, um, very critical for global economies, absolutely. I think the, the differentiation I would make is one thing. The, the US dollar has a very particular, um, is in a very particular state because it's the most widely circulated currency in the world. And when we talk about the dollar, yes, we are overprinting and we were increasing the debt, but at the same time, uh, the whole world relies on it. That gives it a lot of boost that it wouldn't have had um, should the dollar not be in its current place. But that doesn't mean that it will be the situation going forward, especially if we keep imposing sanctions left and right on countries and alienating uh, global partners and, and even uh, allies. That is a very big risk, I think, on global relations. I'm already starting to see governments and companies around the globe that are uh, talking about trading uh, bilaterally in their local currencies and finding a way to, to create the clearing mechanisms 
uh, that includes the EU, Japan, um, obviously Russia, Iran, etc. A lot of these blocks that have issues um, with the current movement of funds, and every time we put sanctions, we say, well, it's all denominated in dollars. Oil is sold, oil and gas is in dollars. Every dollar passes through our clearing systems, uh, so we control the world. If we overuse that tool, I think it's going to uh, backfire, and I think we're at a place where we're starting to see some of these conversations started. So hopefully in the long term, this can be corrected. But, um, but to go back, not to divert from the original question, I think they're connected. Um, I think the, um, the impact of um, having um, like offshore accounts and uh, printing money by governments is definitely a big threat to, to global economic stability in the, the medium term. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right with the, the dollar uh, uh, ruling as the currency, especially the uh, the JCPO cancellation and the Europeans being dissatisfied with the secondary sanctions for trying to trade with uh, Iran. Uh, previously, OPEC had, had seen uh, a lot of conversation about moving away from the dollar denomination for OPEC trading and perhaps a basket of currencies, but uh, the JCPOA being canceled, that's, that has really accelerated the, uh, the move away from the dollar. So that, that could be a, a significant uh, piece of the, of the global economy. Uh, let me ask uh, Amr, I've got a question for you. You and I were talking uh, previously about uh, the, uh, the concept of this investing at home, uh, growing your economy rather than buying it and bringing it in. And, and you, uh, I think you gave a statistic uh, or a, a premise, $100 million and buy 200, uh, pay for 200 entrepreneurs instead of bringing in business. What, what would be the, uh, the, the mechanism for uh, making that sort of uh, reality possible? And, and the, the second question, my last question uh, tonight, and I'll invite uh, the audience to contribute a couple more if they care to. Uh, the, other, the other question I would have is, um, you talked about the pandemic and the lockdown inspiring a lot of work at home culture shifts and that that could actually enhance the global connectedness of uh, people where they aren't uh, confined to office spaces and cubicles and so forth, but uh, can reach out to anywhere from the comfort of their home. Yeah, two, two very important questions. I'll, uh, I'll start with the first one. I think just to simplify it, um, think of the government or tax money as just money to be invested to create the best outcome and the most equitable outcome for everybody. If you look at our history as just the US, and then that applies to the whole world, but uh, like I can give you some details on that. Our top return on investments of tax money investment has been in terms of job creation, economic impact, growth, every aspect that you look into has been in science and technology. So when, when the government funded the research to, to that turned into the creation of Google and uh, what the NASA has come up with that has, uh, has supported quantum computing and other areas of the government and scientific research and, and healthcare and, and uh, biomedical engineering and, and, and th those are, this is the highest return on our dollars invested. What led to the creation of the internet ultimately, what's leading today to the creation of uh, whatever, cryptocurrency, etc. A lot of that has been initially funded by the government by tax money and this has produced the most return on on any investment anywhere that's at the top at the bottom of that is actually the money that has been spent on attracting or incentivizing jobs and the reason why this is even more relevant today is take take us as a city only as a city not as a country not as a state as a city if we convince a company to move a thousand people to Nashville today. Um, this is a company typically that would be, unless they're relocating and moving headquarters, that's a different case. In most cases, we're talking about a global company or um, a very large company that decides to create a back office or an office and provide a thousand jobs for Nashville. Now we pay for these thousand jobs. We pay incentives for these thousand jobs. And those are typically back office jobs that are doing functions that are supporting the overall operation of that company. Typically, because of changes in technology and because of changes in 
uh, and transformations. A lot of these end up being not really hired or sourced locally. A lot of these come from the outside and the re relocations happen, that's one. Two, a lot of these jobs don't need to exist because they've been automated out in 10 years. So if you are an investor and you have $100 today and you're being asked, do you, do you want to invest in something that would become 50% of its value in 10 years versus investing in something that will only grow over time? It's a clear choice. Unfortunately, when it comes to like government decisions on, on economic growth, it's not being approached in that way. And this is a culture that has evolved over time. And, and in, in the last five to seven years, this has, um, the, the knowledge around those sectors has multiplied by several, several uh, folds. Um, and and the, the best example to give you is Silicon Valley, or as, as a hub of global innovation, initially was created over a period of 15 to 20 years, funded by defense money, semiconductor defense money going and creating that corridor. But that created a spark of like something that the world has like been blown out by and the, the tenacity and the continuous growth and the contribution to global change and to the global economy has been fabulous of what happened. So a lot of scientists, a lot of researchers have gone and tried to understand that model and see how, how can we learn from that? How can we learn from that model and try to replicate it into a city model, a model for a city. And that's how you see cities such as um, all the way from like locally Austin, um, St. Louis, Boston, Seattle, Denver, that have recreated their economic model from one that is based on sourcing outside um, jobs or incentivizing uh, relocations to creating their own, creating their own meaning, investing in their um, in the company that today has 10 people that in 10 years has the potential to, to be a global company with 50,000 people. This is a big win for your investment money. And that's the example I was giving you, Pat, when we were speaking. I was saying, if right. you want to invest that money, would you invest it in creating the jobs of the future that have the potential to nurture and multiply, or you would invest it in something that is, that's the end of it, is those are the jobs that you're relocating, that's it, they're not going to grow they're not going to multiply there's no reason for that because that's the agreement you're you're having it's a very different model and the infrastructure for the city for that to, to happen like the ecosystem and how the different parts the different assets that we have from um, academic institutions to research center centers to investments need to be organized with purpose slightly different and this is something i think that we can capitalize a lot on and do a little bit differently Maybe if we can uh, just briefly talk a little bit about the uh, connect connectivity uh, and how the culture is changing. Yeah, so the connectivity in, 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 in very brief terms, first of all, the office, the, the, the way companies look at the office space has completely shifted. Um, companies, um, I know countless companies that are, that employ tens of thousands of people that have told their teams, we only need 20% to be back in the office between now and the end of the year. And after that, we'll, we'll see what we'll do. We don't know what's gonna happen. So that's the first piece of, do we really need the office space? And how much do we need that? This is a conversation that's happening. And a lot of the conclusions that I'm talking to global um, executives about is saying, you know what? It's a trade-off because I I'm trading off diversity and having the ability to be talking in one meeting to a team in 10 different countries of 10 people in different in 10 different countries to people sitting with me in the office. Now there are benefits for them to be in the office, but they are starting to realize now that they have been forced to do it and, and see it for a few months that the trade-off actually tips more towards diversity. So today as a company sitting in Nashville, you don't need to have all your people around you coming to the office. Now you can have somebody in Warsaw and somebody in Paris and somebody in Kuala Lumpur and somebody in, in San Francisco and all collaborate and create value as, as a team. That opens up a lot more uh, business opportunities, but that will disrupt also how companies function. Sure. 
Terrific. Uh, we have one last comment, not a question uh, from Bob. He follows up on uh, the debt question. He uh, notes that uh, perhaps the debt and uh, the debt encumbered central banks and financial agents will have to collapse in order to return to fiscal responsibility. Uh, he adds that uh, we humans created the situation and only we humans can solve it. And I think that's probably a good place to end. Carl, if uh, you and Amr have any closing comments and then I'll, uh, I'll wrap uh, things I up. I thank Amr for, uh, for being here. And again, congratulations on, uh, and I thank you so much. You and your family to stay healthy and happy and uh, I hope the rest of the year is uh, equally good for you. Likewise, I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Great. Well, thank you uh, all for uh, coming tonight. And again, a reminder that uh, tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. we have a terrific uh, webinar. Uh, the Alliance for Securing Democracy uh, has two speakers uh, who will be talking about the foreign interference uh, undermining the 2020 election. Uh, next week uh, on Tuesday evening, we have Nancy Lindborg, the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, who will be here to talk about uh, the pandemic impact uh, on peace and conflict resolution uh, and talk a little bit about what the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, does and, and who they are. Uh, we also have our news review at 2 p.m. Uh, Ambassador Dick Bowers and I go through the top five topics in the news. So please uh, tune into those webinars and take a look at our archive at youtube.com slash TNWAC for all the terrific programs that we put together in the last uh, couple of months. Again, uh, thanks uh, Amr al Saini for uh, joining us this evening. Thank you, Mayor Dean. Uh, it's always good to see you uh, here on Tuesday nights. And uh, that's it uh, for our uh, Global National with Carl Dean. Everyone, please be safe.